So welcome. Um, I am Shannon Baldioli. I'm an educator at the National Air and Space Museum. Delighted that you're joining us for our first of two virtual professional development sessions this year. Um, this one is going along with Air and Space's monthly theme about space imagery. Um, our monthly theme focuses a lot on art and creative outlets based on space images and space exploration and stories. Um, but we're going to talk to you all tonight a little bit about visualizing data. Um, I've heard over the years, lots of STEM, STEAM teachers that I've worked with are really interested in data and data literacy, um, having their students analyze data. So we're going to kind of combine all of those things together this evening. Um, we're going to kick off with a presentation by Dr. Kimberly R. Cand, who is joining us um, from Smithsonian's Astrophysical Observatory in uh, Massachusetts. And she's going to talk a little bit about her work with visualization and imagery and uh, probably a little bit about sonification as well, which we're very excited about. Um, and then I'm also joined by Hunter Borgeli. She is our teacher PD fellow. Um, and so she'll be talking a little bit about how um, you could potentially do some data visualization with students in the classroom. So I'm going to pass it over to, um, to Kim, but I wanted to kind of start out with a question, which is one that I get a lot. Um, I work on an exhibit in which we talk about space instruments and um, images from space. And what people ask me the most is, is that what I would really see if I were in space? Um, so if I were able to be standing next to the Crab Nebula, which um, I don't imagine folks would recommend for me, but if I were standing out there, is this amazing image in the background here what I would see? Um, so I will let um, Kim talk to us a little bit about her work. Great. Thanks so much for having me tonight. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we get to color the universe, but I am going to bring it down to a multi-sensory approach. We're going to talk more than just sight. We're going to talk, talk about touch and also sound very briefly. Um, I get to work for NASA's Chandra X Observatory. It is a sister telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope, to the James Webb Space Telescope. It goes about a third of the way to the moon. We operate it here at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory for NASA. And essentially, Chandra has been looking at the high energy universe um, in X-ray vision, if you will, for about almost 25 years, which is pretty fantastic. Chandra gets to look at really incredible things in our universe, things like exploding stars, black holes, clusters of galaxies. I have a few of my favorite images that I'm just going to pop through on a very tiny little mini tour of the universe. So things like the pillars of creation where these you know little baby stars are being formed in tall columns of gas and dust. Uh, the Carina Nebula are part of it where there's more star formation going on and where you can see the slightly older stars in X-ray light are throwing off the these little temper tantrums of X-ray light, uh, things like 30 Doradas, where there's additional clusters of stars buried deep inside these bits of gas and dust. Stars that are like our sun, but that are more advanced in their lifetimes and that are starting to puff off their outer layers and turn into planetary nebulas. And also things like stars that are dancing together, like our Aquarii, um, that are just throwing out this beautiful, beautiful lane um, of dust in the optical light. And then of course, some of my favorite objects in the universe, things like exploded stars, things like galaxies that are interacting, groups and clusters of galaxies, and even galaxy clusters that look like they're smiling back at us thanks to gravitational lensing. So it's a pretty beautiful universe out there. Um, and back to the question earlier on if this was, you know, exactly how things would be if we were able to fly in our spaceship out to say the Crab Nebula or 30 Doradas? And the answer is no, primarily because most of the light we're looking at is light outside of the human realm of visible or optical light. And I'll talk a little bit more about multi-wavelength astronomy in a second. But first I wanna talk about how we capture this data. So again, working for Chandra, I'm focusing on X-ray light. So we have these objects in the universe that Chandra is going to monitor or check out. That light has been traveling to Chandra for some long period of time because these objects are all pretty far away. That light is then captured down on Chandra's detectors and then it's packaged up into a digital suitcase of ones and zeros and transported down to Earth through NASA's deep space network. So all of the data that we start out with 
looks like this, just dreams of ones and zeros, just simple binary code. And it's our job to unpack that digital suitcase and turn it into something else. So typically that might be something like a table of information. That's kind of like the very basic starting point, if you will. We have the time, we have the location, the X and the Y, um, we have the energy. We have all these little bits of information that we've been able to capture about each photon, each little packet of energy that struck the detector during the observation. And so once we have this wonderful, beautiful table, we can then do more with it. Scientists can analyze it. They can figure out what kind of spectral information like the fingerprint of that light, and then we can turn it into an image. So what I have up here on my screen now is sort of the early stages of our image processing. This is of one of my very most favorite objects in the entire universe, which is the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant, a star about eight to time, eight to 10 times the size of our sun that started to run out of the fuel, it collapsed and just exploded its guts out all over the universe. So we're looking at this incredible high energy debris field of this star that exploded uh, a long, long time ago. And on the lower left corner, this is the raw data of just one observation that, that Chandra took in about an hour's time. And then on the upper right, we have a stacked observation. So we've been able to take multiple hour or longer shots and then combine them together into a co-added observation. And then from there, we kind of figure out, well, what, what is the scientific story of this object and what is that information that we're trying to communicate? Whether we're communicating with fellow scientists, whether we're communicating with educators, where we're communicating with students, whatever it might be, there is an audience for this data and we're trying to figure out how to tell that scientific story to the audience. So this is the very first image that we ever released of Cassiopeia A when uh, Chandra was just recently launched, so back in 1999. And this is just one hour of looking at this exploded star. It's color coded by essentially the intensity of the energy levels that Chandra picked up on this object. And after studying it now for almost 25 years, we now have a lot of data. So now all of that data we can stack and co-add together to get a deeper picture of what this object looks like. We now have much more detailed information of that fingerprint, that spectral information of that light, and we can actually split it out by the chemical emission. So we can understand where the pockets of iron are, where the silicon, the calcium, the sulfur, the argon, the neon, all of those different chemical elements that have been ejected out into space we can now sort of map them into a bit of a weather map, if you will, where we're now seeing, for example, the iron is color coded in purple uh, and the oxygen is in yellow, et cetera. And this, this colorful map actually tells us a story about that beautiful stellar barf that we require here on our planet to survive, right? We need these chemical elements in order to function. We have oxygen to breathe and we need iron in our blood and we need calcium in our bones. And that's where a lot of this stuff comes from, from previous generations of stars that it exploded a long, long time ago. So it's a beautiful image, but it's also full of science -y goodness inside, right? All of those photons that translate to those pixels, they've just, they've just got all this like wonderful information tucked inside. But, you know, when we have great information, when we have telescopes like Chandra and Hubble and Webb and others that can look at objects over time, we're not just adding things to get a deep single image. We're also going to add things so that we can see the dynamic nature of these objects. So this is Cassiopeia A that we're now seeing as it's actually um, continuing out on its acceleration. So its expansion is now visible in this time-lapse movie that we're, we're watching. And that's a fantastic piece of information to be able to share that these objects, they're constantly changing, right? Things are constantly in motion uh, in the universe. And I think it's easy to think of the universe as sort of, I don't know, staid and peaceful in a way when it feels like things don't change because we're just seeing stills. But this information is very, very dynamic and being able to capture a remnant as it expands outward is pretty cool. Um, but we can also figure out which of the information is moving away from us, which of it is moving towards us to be able to create a 3D model. When we have great data, that's a fantastic thing to be able to do 
because then we can 3D print it. So now we're sharing it beyond in new ways that we really weren't expecting to be able to before. Uh, we work particularly with people who are blind or low vision to make sure these models make a lot of sense tactilely. Um, all of these models are available on the Chandra website. So if you do have access to 3D printers, it's something you can print for yourself as well. We've brought it into things like virtual reality and augmented reality as another way to understand this data as different kinds of teaching tools. And we've even brought it into this idea of sonification, which is translating that data into sound. So we're not holding up a microphone to capture the sound. What we are doing is translating visual information or something that's been translated from those ones and zeros into a visual representation. And from there, translating it into an audio-based representation, particularly for people who are blind or low vision or just have another way of learning or another way of trying to learn something. Let's hopefully you can hear the sound. What we've done is all of those chemical elements that I mentioned earlier, we've assigned them to a different sound and a different um, note. And then as we're scanning through the image from the center out along those pathways, we're essentially sampling all of that information through sound versus just through color. It's just another way of understanding the data and another way of presenting it to different audiences. But everything that I've talked about, it all just came from ones and zeros. This is actually a snapshot of the binary code that makes up the data that was captured on Cassiopeia A. So you can imagine that there are endless possibilities on how to translate this into some other way of knowing. Um, I mentioned earlier about the importance of multi-wavelength astronomy and going back to the question of how it is that we're seeing these things. And it really is multi-wavelength astronomy is just such an important part of being able to figure out the universe around us, right? So now I've got a galaxy up instead of an exploded star. It's the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. And we can look at it in these different slices of light. We can see an X-ray light where we're seeing these neutron stars and black holes, this hot bit of diffuse gas, X-ray binaries, pairs that are hanging out together and kind of dancing. Then we've got the slightly cooler ultraviolet radiation that we're picking up now. We're seeing these stars and these beautiful spiral structure. And then in the optical light, now we're seeing again, slightly cooler material yet still. Now we're seeing those beautiful dust lanes starting to take shape, lots of stars, slightly older stars. And then finally the infrared light on the last panel. Now we're seeing the coolest material of all and we're kind of seeing down to the bones of the galaxy, right? So we have all of those different kinds of light um, none of which we can really see with the human eye, or at least not well. The optical light we can see, of course, with the human eye, but it's our vision is just not strong enough to be able to detect this level of detail. So telescopes like Hubble just really greatly magnify things and the intensity is brought up so that we can see it. And then you combine those four different kinds of light and you have a very different way of experiencing this object. And you can trace, you can see those red bones of that spiral galaxy with the infrared data. And you can see those bright pockets of purple that's telling you there's some really fascinating high energy stuff that's happening there. And then, you know, that's grounded in the more mid-range optical and ultraviolet light, those sort of uh, greens and blues that you're seeing. So all together, they tell a lovely story as a whole. Um, I don't want to go too much longer because I want to get to questions, but I thought I'd show one more exploded star because they're my favorite. And this one is just taking you through kind of like some of our processes for doing our image processing. Um, I'll just briefly play it again so you can see. We're going to start off with the raw image that still has artifacts and everything else in it. And then we're going to quickly go to one of the preliminary science images where the scientists were really trying to figure out what is the story here to tell. And then after that, you'll see that we'll start working on color because in this image, what we had been able to glean was essentially parts of the image that were moving towards us and parts of the image that were moving away from us. So the red shift and the blue shift. And we color coded the red shifted and the blue shifted information just so, so that the red shifted information is red and the blue shifted is blue. So this remnant was color coded in a very specific, specific way to give us that understanding of the dimensionality of the data. 
So color can really play a lot of different roles, whether it's the chemical emission, whether it's the different kinds of light, or in this case, whether it's the red shift versus blue shift. Um, and again, similarly like Cassiopeia A, we're able to model this in 3D, 3D print it and bring it into sound. I think I'll stop with this last uh, demonstration of the sonification because this one's a better, I think, example of how we do the sonification, especially by layer. So we're first gonna hear just the optical data of this area where the supernova remnant is. And you're gonna hear it as a, a lovely little instrument as we scan out from the center. So it's like harp sound, and you're kind of hearing all of those background stars as plucks on a harp. And then the next one is just the x-ray data, and you'll hear it's more of a synthesized sound. And then now we've got a layer of that spectral information that I mentioned earlier, that fingerprints of the light. And then we put them together into one piece. You could hear as we start in the center and started moving out, the pitch changing, the intensity really deepening. You could hear the different layers of the x-ray light. You can still hear the little plucks, if you will, of the harp strings for the optical stars. And then very clearly, once you reach past that uh, area around the shock, the shock wave all around the perimeter of that exploded star, you hear the drop off, right, where the x-ray data stops and then you're just in space and now you're just hearing stars. So it's a very different way to be able to understand the data. It's a very different way to be able to represent the data. Um, but we found it just a really exciting way to be able to reach new people, new audiences, and learn about our own data in, in the meantime. So I think I would love to move to questions at this point. Um, I think I guess Hunter goes back to you. Yeah, thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. I'm kind of and I know there's a lot of notes in the chats of people just kind of like mind blown how all this kind of works. <laughs> um, awesome. Myself included, for sure. Uh, I think one of the big things that has come up is this idea of um, like color coding the different colors to different wavelengths or different elements um, or types of sounds, uh, like the harp sounds or the, the kind of synthetic sounds. Um, are they always the same color to whatever it is you're assigning it to? Is that something that's standardized or do you just kind of get to pick how you're feeling that day? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I always like to say that the science story is really what's driving the data visualization process no matter what. However, there are some quasi standards that we follow, meaning oftentimes we're gonna use the red, green, blue approach where the lowest energy is color coded red up to the highest energy that's color coded in blue with median green in between. Uh, you saw that as a, an example in the um, M51 Whirlpool Galaxy color coding for light. And that works very well oftentimes, but unfortunately it doesn't always work. So even though there is a sort of standardization in that the low, medium, high thing can work, it doesn't always work. And it's always not possible to 
have just those colors assigned to just those different types of light or different types of energies. Because as I mentioned, when we're showcasing Cassiopeia A, for example, and we have that really rich, deep data that we're understanding which of it is iron and which of it is silicon and which of it is sulfur and which of it is calcium, you run out of colors really quick, right? You have to be able to represent all those colors in a very strategic way to make sure you're not losing data when combining multiple things. Uh, an image can get overwhelmed very easily if you have too much information. And similarly, if you're trying to represent something that's more topographical in nature, or again, three-dimensional, like we saw with Tycho, being able to use uh, different colors really makes sense for those different scientific stories. So though there is a sort of standard in that red, green, blue is the best approach typically, it doesn't always work out like that. And that scientific information really does have to be the main focus. I guess similarly with sound, there's a lot less standardization when it comes to sonification at this point. Sonification is still relatively new um, as far as the field of scientific data visualization. It's relatively new. And people are really very much figuring out what makes the most sense. However, I can say we do a lot of testing and we work with people who are blind and low vision specifically to make sure that the meaning making that can be pulled out of that data experience really does make sense, particularly for someone who is not going to be prioritizing the visual. And so that means that you have to be able to understand the scientific story through sound in a way that hopefully adds value. Um, so again, with with standardization in sonification, um, it's really not quite as clear cut, especially when you have such different kinds of data sets to work with. You really wanna make sure the way you're telling the story is very clear. And sometimes you have to be very creative in order to be clear and authentic to the data and precise uh, with how that is gonna be translated. So I hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you. Um, another question we got was, how do you distinguish between real and then these kind of like enhanced pictures or these like kind of composite images? And then is there a reason why images are enhanced besides just how beautiful they look? Um, I know that for myself personally, it wasn't until fairly recently that I didn't realize that this is this isn't what you would see if you were driving past, you know, Crab Nebula in space. Um, mm. so, so how do you know, like what it is that you're seeing if we were to show these to students in the classroom and then like, what's the why behind it? Yeah, I guess I would have to get a little philosophical and ask what is real, right? You can think of it like, uh, the sweater that I'm wearing, it's a blue sweater and that makes it fun to wear. I love blue. It's one of my favorite colors, but if this sweater was red, it would still be real. Um, it's just whatever the, the fashion designer, I guess, decided to color it. Um, it's kind of a similar thing because, again, we're representing data that humans can't naturally perceive for the most part. Um, X-ray light, infrared light, uh, ultraviolet light, radio light, gamma ray light. We can't see any of that. And even in the visible light spectrum, if Hubble's looking at something, the Hubble can also see an ultraviolet and a little bit of infrared too. Um, if Hubble's looking at something, even in the optical light, it's such an intense magnification um, beyond what humans can detect with our own eyes. And so I think the differentiation between real and enhanced is a little fuzzy for me because you know, if you take a picture of a sunset and you're seeing the sunset with your eyes and your camera is seeing the sunset and taking a picture that looks nothing like what you just saw. It looks utterly depressing usually when I'm taking a picture of a sunset with my cell phone, right? Um, which is real, right? So is that image that the camera took, is that the real view? Is what you saw with your own eyes the real view? And then if you're trying to communicate that sunset to your loved one, um, if you enhance it you, with some of the tools that are built in your phone to brighten the levels up and enhance the color to make it more like what you saw, is then that real, right? So I think it's a very philosophical approach, but I would just say, for me, I think it's really key to just talk about the fact that this is data. These are not space selfies. We're not holding up our cell phone to the sky and just snapping because that's not how it works. We can't, we're not, we're not uh, 
humans don't have strong enough eyes to see this naturally and our small little bits of equipment can't possibly, right? So we have to create these telescopes, these satellites, these observatories that can capture information that we cannot see. And then we have to write the software that can then translate it into something we can either see or touch or hear. So yeah, I don't know if that answers it all the way, but uh, if not, I'd be happy to to follow up with more. No, I, I can take I can like answer answer. very long. I don't want to like <laughs> put anybody yeah. to sleep. So. <laughs> um, I kind of our, our next kind of point might be a little more um, concrete of an answer. Uh, how many data sets does it take to make one of the like one of those images? So you kind of talked about how it starts with that binary information. You take turn that, you kind of translate that into a data set, and then you have different data sets to pull into your final image or sonification. How much data does typically go into one of those images? Mm. Well, it really depends on the telescope, of course. For a telescope like Chandra, there are just fewer X-rays out there in the universe, unfortunately, or fortunately, perhaps. Um, and so, you know, you have to work a little harder to capture them. So we might need to add, I don't know, five or six different uh, observations together, stack them all together in order to get a nice, clear picture uh, that we might like for X-ray light. It might take less with something like the Hubble um, or James Webb Space Telescope. Those are operating in optical and infrared different regimes. And so it's going to typically take a little less time because there's more of that light out there. And you can then figure out, again, I have to go back to that. What is the scientific story that you're trying to communicate, right? So if you have just an X-ray image of an exploded star, that might tell the story just fine. If you are communicating that story to fellow scientists, perhaps for a scientific paper, you're probably good. If you're going to bring that scientific data set out into a more general audience, right, and your image, say, gives the impression that it's something that could be captured under a microscope, right, you're not offering any sort of immediate visual context to that data set. So then perhaps you want to add an optical background of the same field of view and grab one data set over there to make sure that you're offering that visual context so that now when someone sees this image, they can more immediately recognize that it is indeed an object of space and not something stuck on the bottom of your shoe or under a microscope or whatever it might be, right? So it's all about figuring out the scientific story and then the audience and what it is that you're gonna be communicating through those things. And that will give you the amount of data or how many data sets to pull together. When it comes to certain images, like when I showed the M51 Whirlpool Galaxy earlier, we had those four different data sets from four different kinds of light, I should say. And then each of those uh, slices of light that we were showing were also made up of different observations. So for that one image stacked all together, at least 20 data sets would be my guess and probably higher to have to go back and look at the observations uh, and the observation numbers and all that. And in that case, the whole point was to see how all of these lights could kind of come together to, you know, if you're playing the flute or if you're playing a guitar or if you're playing a piano or if you're playing a trombone, those all sound beautiful separate. But when you are playing a piece together and there are those moments of harmony and those little moments of solo, like that's kind of what we're often looking for in a data set. So if we're pulling together multiple data sets, it's because there are going to be moments of harmony and there are going to be moments of solo. And we want to be able to capture all of that um, in one piece. So yeah, I hope that uh, sort of helps clear it up. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we got kind of one last question here to kind of wrap it up. Um, you mentioned that the Chandra images and media, um, is there any data that we can find for our students or anything um, from that program that we could use in the classroom? Yeah, so actually up on my screen right now um, are a few images from students 
these were recently just sent to me too. So this was just done at a school, I think in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so they are using actual data from Chandra and other observatories as well in our pencil code base. It's kind of like turtle programming, um, very simple introduction to image processing. You can find out more on chandra.si.edu slash code. And you can see that um, using some very simple uh, code block type of techniques. The students are actually compositing images, just like you would composite, say, you know, uh, a picture of a face with uh, one of those silly filters over it in Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, right? It's the same type of coding technique in order to stack layers of data together. And instead, they're using it to be able to stack these different data sets from NASA together. So in this case, it's a star forming region that they're working with. NGC 1333, and they've got different kinds of light from the infrared, from the optical, from XI light, and they're able to assign each one their own color and build up their own composite. Um, and that's really lovely because it's a very easy way for students to be able to see quite quickly how they can just take plain black and white data and create their own composite of different kinds of light or different kinds of uh, energies for one different kind of light, for example. So that's just a, an example of what you can do to be able to take NASA data into your own classroom and be able to composite it together. Uh, we have a lot of different examples of um, everything I've talked about, essentially. It's all on the Chander website. So whether you wanna hear more about the sonifications, if you wanna try the 3D printable files, check out some virtual reality or go to the image processing activity that I mentioned, you can capture those URLs here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim. So we are going to kind of take what Kim was talking about and maybe simplify it a little bit more for the, a, a classroom setting and look at some other ways to visualize data um, that are maybe a little more uh, tangible, might be you know something you can do uh, hands-on. Um, maybe something less intimidating than taking all those ones and zeros and turning it into those amazing pictures, but something to strive for. Shannon's actually gonna start us off with uh, talking a little bit more about getting comfortable with data and using data just in general in the classroom. Yeah, so one of the things I've had teachers ask me about a lot is sort of getting students data literate, getting them ready to look at a data set. And I pasted into the chat the website that Dr. Arcan shared um, about the pencil code, which is really great. It's like a step-by-step -step process to get students looking at data and turn that data into imagery. Um, you'll notice there's some uh, videos on the website. You'll notice a very familiar face as Kim herself shows up in many of the videos talking about it. Um, but I wanted to share another great tool um, that I've used before and that... Um, a former colleague and dear friend loves to talk about when it comes to analyzing data, that tool is called CodeApp. Um, and it's a great way to get students taking a look at data sets and understanding sort of how you can make data um, play off of, you know, different aspects of your data set play off of each other. So CodeApp is um, a free open source software. So it's CodeApp, C-O-D-A-P.org. Um, if you just Google code app, it will come up there. So you can click on launch code app here and it's going to pop up something that looks a bit like this. Um, you can open a document or browse examples and um, put your own data in there. I chose mammals, right? So I'll take my mammals, right? This is the name of the animal over here on the left and snap it into the axis here. You'll see my animals line up right there on the left. Um, so then also at the bottom, right, I want to know hours of sleep. I have two small children, so a number of hours of sleep are very important to analyze in my house. And I'm going to put their hours of sleep right down here. So we can see that those bats and lions and hyenas and opossums need a lot of sleep. And then maybe you want to think with your students about how the size of that animal may impact how much they sleep. So if you snap that into the middle... Now we've got color coding that shows you um, smallest mass in pink to, to largest mass in red. And you can play with this data lots of different ways. Um, I see folks in the chat made, um, the roller coaster one is really fun. You can um, compare and contrast roller coasters. You can pick specific 
um, pieces of data. So you may be able, you may want to go in there and only click on roller coasters you've ridden on and see how they stack up. Um, so CodeApp is a really great um, resource and tool to get students excited about um, analyzing data and show them about show them how to um, take a look at a data set. Um, my mammal is is confused about whether she wants to be down here or not. Um, so you can get them a little comfortable with it. As I said, you can bring your own data in here. Um, you can save these things. You can share out to your class. It's a really great tool to use to kind of introduce um, uh, data sets to your students. And I'm going to stop sharing so Hunter can share. And um, she's going to kind of go into a little bit about creative data visualization. So we're kind of talking about that, like be beautiful images and these different things that you can do to get a little more creative with it. So CodeApp is showing graphs, which can be beautiful. Um, but now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the more crafty and creative ways to do this. Okay, so one of the things you could do is take this idea of graphing, just like we saw on Kodap, and just like Shannon said, be a little bit more creative. Um, and one of the things that I think has come up a lot in the last handful of years, several years, is this idea of like mood journaling. So it's very much like not a hard science. It doesn't have to be like super intense um, numbers and data. It could, you really do this with any kind of information. Um, but just this idea that you can take a graph and make it a lot more visually appealing, make it more interesting to look at, um, you know, for thinking about how do we take data and, and turn it into a visual medium and make it so that people can understand it in a different way. Adding this idea of, of color or different orientations of your graph can be a simple way to do that. So we've got some examples of just like a block calendar somebody's made and different colors represent different emotions. If there's any um, elementary folks in, in the uh, group today, if you're doing like zones of regulation, your blue zones, your yellow zones, that may be a great way to track that with students. Um, this person has kind of a, a line graph, plot graph going um, with the same kind of information. Another one over here with just laid out in a circle. So it's really the same kind of data, um, the same kind of idea, even really just using uh, colors and different date points, um, but very different ways to show the same um, data just with a few tweaks. Another idea that might be um, something more unique than what you kind of typically see in a classroom setting uh, is something like a temperature quilt or a data blanket. Um, again, it can be with any data that you want to use. This is just kind of the idea um, for it. But a temperature blanket, for example, would be um, every day or every week. Uh, you you knit or you sew or you embroider or you take a piece of paper and you put it on a you know another piece of paper and make a, a paper weaving um, and the color represents the the temperature for that day or for that week and at the end of the year at the end of the month you have this great visual of data um, that's like kind of color blocked uh, from beginning to end. On the left there is uh, a quilt made by Dr. Um, Laura, uh, Dr. Laura Gerton. She's a professor of earth science at Penn State. Um, Shannon had the privilege of kind of hearing her speak at a conference and getting to hear more background about what she does with these quilts. Shannon, I'm actually going to have you talk about this one real quick. Yeah, it's so exciting. So I was at a conference and we had already decided on doing this PD and I met Dr. Gerton and it was such an amazing connection. So she's a scientist that started quilting just in her spare time. And this quilt actually represents um, shoreline loss in Louisiana. And um, you'll notice that um, at the top of the quilt, it sort of comes down like a graph. So the green and like sort of tan area is shoreline. And then um, the water is represented by the sort of watery color there. And then you'll notice partway down that all of a sudden she's got a different type of fabric in there. And that is because in Louisiana, um, they have come up with this idea that they are recycling Christmas trees. So they create this big sort of like barge um, 
across the coastline, out a little ways from the um, the actual coast and all of the old Christmas trees that people have had live Christmas trees that people have had in their house get kind of thrown on this barge and they create a water break so that rising um, water levels and sort of more intense wave action isn't eroding the coast as quickly. So if you'll notice those first few bars, the, um, the land mass goes down much more quickly. And once she adds in the Christmas tree piece, you'll see the there's still loss of coastline, but it's much smaller. And she's got some really amazing stuff. I will, um, if Hunter hasn't already dropped in the chat, some of her other quilt projects, um, she's gone on, um, different ex uh, expeditions and done quilting based on things like temperature and um, other data like that. But um, these quilts are so exciting and interesting. And she was telling us that during the pandemic, she was creating these quilts and people were taking walks in her neighborhood. So she actually started hanging them inside of her glass um, storm door at home and putting like a little label at the bottom of them so that people could come by and take a look at her quilts and see sort of what was going on, um, which was like a really cool and interesting way to kind of develop a craft or something you're passionate about, but also um, kind of weave data in there. So fun and interesting. Thank you. I figured you could probably explain it a lot better than I could. But what's so cool about it is like that could easily be a bar graph and it would show the same information. Um, but this is just, I think, a more interesting way of sharing that might get students more interested in seeing it. Um, it might be better, easier to understand for a student who's maybe still struggling with this concept of something abstract like a like a bar graph um, to see something a little bit more concrete with those with the green and the, the waves to really show what it's representing. Another one you're probably all very familiar with is infographics. Um, I, I'm glad we included this though, because I wanna make sure that it's not overlooked. I think it's something that you might see a lot of, but it is a really great way to show data and to kind of get to be creative with uh, how you might go about showing data. Um, I have a couple examples up there. One is a simple map on the left, uh, just color-coded states, um, TII participants by state, a quick plug for TII. It's our Teacher Innovator Institute uh, that we that NASM hosts in, in the summers uh, for middle school STEAM teachers. Applications are open. We would love to have you join. Uh, Shannon might put that in the chat. <laughs> um, but this shows our participants per state. Um, so just a really way, a really easy way to show that data. Again, it could easily be a graph or it could easily be just like a data table, um, but just an easier way to understand that data. On the right is uh, a fun infographic, well, fun in the visual, maybe not so fun in the content. Uh, infographic of endangered species in Africa. Um, and there's a lot of data being represented in this uh, particular infographic as well, because the colors represent different information, the size of the animal represents information, the way the animals are facing. So if they're facing left or right shows different information. So if they're facing to the left, it shows us that the population is decreasing. If they're facing to the right, it shows us that the population is stable or increasing. Um, so they were able to put a lot of different information into one image, uh, kind of like Kim was talking about earlier. I've got up on the screen some just other considerations as well. Um, thinking about putting vis visualization into the classroom. Uh, Shannon noted there, but really thinking about data literacy. Um, if they don't understand like contextually what the data is telling them or um, how to read data, read a data table, it's gonna be really hard I think to make that leap into visualization. Um, so just making sure that you um, are also having them practice uh, looking at examples of data, looking at examples of data visualization, practicing analyzing it in addition to creating these as well. Uh, this is a great opportunity to collaborate with your colleagues. Um, you collaborate with your music teacher and practice sonifying data that you collect. You could collaborate with your art teacher or your STEAM teacher or your math teacher, whoever it might be, to do a cross-curricular um, 
project for your students. Uh, you could do kind of like we did, have the same data set and have students individually or in groups find different ways to represent them. That could be kind of a good introductory practice. You do one together, you have your own data or you have a data set as a group um, and see how people, different people represent them. You could have different data sets that your students uh, work on as well and create their own different types of visualization. And what I like about that is that it has an assessment really kind of built into it already. You could take your visualization, hand it to another group, and if they can interpret it in an accurate way, then you know that your visualization was uh, effective. If they can't, then either, you know, they either you didn't <laughs> show it very well or they're having troubles reading the data and you have that assessment built right in. Um, and then another another piece to remember too is this would be a great time for data collection practice. Um, you can certainly find pre-made data sets. Um, I have some uh, websites over on the right hand side there of places you can get data. Um, or you can have your students collect data as well. Um, if you have different class periods, you could have them collecting data uh, for different class periods and sharing them throughout the day. Um, those of you that use Pocket Lab, um, that would be a, this would be a great connection with Pocket Lab as well. Um, and then there was a, a question before we started about kind of the steps of visualization. How would you break it down? And really, like we've been talking about uh, practicing analyzing. So you kind of know what it is that you're looking for. You want to decide what data set it is that you're going to use um, and really having it grounded in the purpose of what it is that you want your students to learn. And then what is it that they're trying to say? Uh, like Kim was talking about, what's the story you're trying to tell with your data? Because um, it's it's going to get really overwhelming if like we experience as well, if you have this table in front of you and you're trying to do everything with it, uh, that's not going to be effective for them to create with. And it's not going to be effective for somebody to look at and try to understand either. So deciding which relevant, which data is relevant to their purpose. And then also just consider your audience, your materials. If you don't have a stash of fabric, then don't do something with fabric. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. Um, I think that's something simple, but I think something that we forget a lot as teachers as well. We try to make it amazing when amazing can also be a little bit scaled down. Anything you want to add in there, Shannon, or anybody else as far as kind of uh, classroom applications? I would just highlight those, um, some of those resources. So slow reveal graphs, I actually just learned um, about yesterday. Shout out to Dave from TII for sharing um, these slow reveal graphs, which are a great routine for um, just looking at graphs. Basically, they take the same graph and they remove information from it. And as you scroll, like as you go through the slides, it adds information onto the graph. So you learn a bit each slide about um, something new and students are meant to sort of um, build um, inferences about what the graph might be based on what data is in there. And they have them um, done as Google Slides and you can go through the slide deck and they're even prompting questions in the bottom for the teacher, um, which are really, really great. Um, and then I can't tell you how much time I spent yesterday on what's going on in this graph, which is a New York Times feature, um, which is really, really fun as well. Yeah, we'll just kind of wrap it up as uh, like Shannon said, just some final notes, really all things that have been said already. Um, this is a great way to just uh, kind of diversify what we're sharing with our students, taking data that might not be accessible to everyone right away and turning it into something that students can understand. Um, it can be really scalable to any grade level, regardless of what you teach. Great opportunity to work into interdisciplinary uh, projects into your classroom. Shannon mentioned earlier the NASM Education Monthly theme. It connects really well this month to uh, a lot of the kind of art-based interpretations that they're showing on the NASM um, Educator website. So I highly recommend you check that out. But again, thank you so much for stopping by and hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.